Yes, Stuart. A couple of uh, quick housekeeping items. So, um, introducing a very small elephant in the room. Slack is a sponsor of this conference, but uh, we signed up Stuart for this conversation well before you signed on as a sponsor. Um, full stop. Second housekeeping item is that Stuart and I are currently exceeding the legal limit for the number of Canadians you can have on a stage uh, <laughs> at a single time, so please don't call the fire marshals. Um, Stuart, you are a tech CEO, but I really think of you as an organizational psychologist um, trying to figure out how people communicate in workplaces. As human beings, we are wired to communicate in person, so I can look you in the eye. I can hear the inflection of your voice so I'm clear about what you mean. And part of your goal, your challenge, is to crack the code on how to get people communicating effectively online. Um, you know, we've all experienced this ourselves. I've heard it from so many of the CEOs in the room who I've interviewed that problems with email, stuff gets lost in translation. Um, you're trying to build a better mousetrap. So let's step back. What have you learned about how to get people to communicate effectively online without falling into a lot of the usual sort of minefields? Okay, so um, the, two things. One, um, then this is very high level, so I'm, I'll try and keep it short and then you can also feel free to interrupt me. Um, I first got online in 1992, so now it's 24 years ago. Um, and it just, when, I, when it first happened, it kind of blew my mind that I could communicate with anyone else literally at the speed of light. And this was a little bit before the, the web became popular, but there was a Unix program called Talk, and you could send messages back and forth. But you would literally see each keystroke as someone typed it, so you could see the speed of their typing, and you could see them backspacing when they, they made a typo. And that, like, the idea of... Um, being able to communicate with someone, again, literally at the speed of light, like uh, in a way that was unprecedented, was this transformational thing for me. And when you layer on top of that the perfect memory and retention of computers, uh, I think it's a, a change that's as big for us as a species as the development of written language. So I mean, like above domestication of animals, above the division of labor, you know, maybe just below uh, the development of spoken language. So that might sound super grandiose, but I think we can make a side bet and look back at 10,000 years from now um, and uh, what this was as an inflection point. So I think there's an underlying very long arc um, uh, evolution happening in, in how human beings relate to one another. And then there's the super specific, narrow set of issues that we deal with at Slack. So when we first started building it, it was eight people on the team. And we were heads down for a few months, and then we decided we were going to try and get some friends at other companies to please try to use it. And we quickly discovered that we had designed the perfect product for teams of exactly eight people. Um, <laughs> and uh, we managed to, first of all, it was hard to convince people. That was another thing that we learned, because communication, um, in one sense, when you think about communication in the context of work, it's taken for granted. So it doesn't even count as a software product category. On the other hand, it's the most fundamental thing that people do and wh where they spend the most of their time. So in a knowledge work environment, like maybe at the low end, people spend 30% of their time on communication. If for a manager, it'll be 80%. For an executive, it's 98.5%. Um, so asking them to change the way that they were doing this fundamental thing all at once en masse was, was really challenging and difficult. So it took us a while to figure out, OK, what's going to make it work for teams of 50 people? What's going to make it work for teams of 100 people? And part of that is noise and attention management. But uh, we're, we're still at the point, and this may never change, that if you were to take a 5,000-person organization and just turn Slack on for them all at once, it guaranteed failure. Like, just there's no chance of that being successful. It's one of those things that requires, um, I don't know, like a sourdough starter yeast or something like that. There has to be some culture. Because if you're the 175th person coming into an existing Slack team uh, and everyone else is already ready, guaranteed success. So there's, um, there's a lot of things we haven't figured out yet. One of the things that we have figured out is the value of lateral transparency and being able to see the conversations that are happening across the organization by making communication public by default as opposed to closed inside of people's email inboxes is transformational for many organizations. Like, and, and they can be nonprofits. We, you know, we have the federal government using it. We have all kinds of for-profit businesses. We have traditional like manufacturing businesses, and we have high tech. Um, so there's, it, it, it applies to something about how human beings relate to each other rather than something that's industry-specific. And I'd love to talk about culture. I, 
I always enjoy interviewing serial entrepreneurs because it's not often in life that you get a chance to hit the reset button and say, I'm going to keep everything that worked and everything that didn't work, I'm going to leave that behind. Um, so what lessons have you learned about building an effective culture? That's a, it's a very tough question um, for me because we actually just had an all hands at the company this morning. And this <laughs> maybe four or five weeks ago, we had a board meeting. And there's a, a Slack channel inside of our Slack instance called CEO where people can just ask me questions. And so someone asked, what do you guys talk about at the board meeting? Look, what goes on? What are, what are people worried about? What do you talk about in the future? So this one was, um, uh, we presented a bunch of the board deck and talked about how, you know, what we were talking about in the meeting. And then also um, a set of strategy slides that we had developed to kick off 2016. Because I realized that part of my job now is building relationships with public market investors for the eventuality that we were ever to become a public company. But I also spent a lot of time talking to reporters. I spent a lot of time with external audiences like this. And I talk about you know, the vision and what we're doing, how the business is growing, and a bunch of metrics. But I don't get to communicate that internally. And so this is one example um, of, I, I guess, the, the thing that I have learned is you have to really turn up the volume on the things that you want to be important for people. I you very easily fall into the habit of having those conversations publicly and you know, never saying those same things. I mean, I get to the point where it's, it's pat. Like I've just said this, you know, I've narrated over this slide presentation or I've answered this question so many times that I can just do it with my eyes closed. And yet, the people inside the company haven't heard it. And so whether that's about the state of the business, the goals for the year, whether that's about values and practices we want to have, whether that's, you know, whatever it is, um, repetition matters. And the, and the volume on those things really matters. And you mentioned values. I'd love to hear what yours are at, at Slack. So the, uh, on the second or third day for a new employee, there's a CEO welcome. And I, like, I have to introduce the values with a little bit of a joke by saying that um, we had a management offsite and we used that to discuss corporate values. And sorry, that's not meant to be a funny joke, uh, but it's just like to poke fun at the concept because there's such uh, a deep level of cynicism about the idea of values. And there's also like such a, the, the typical result is very, very generic. You know, like it could apply to anyone. So um, the philosophical position that we took in trying to figure it out was what, what is like unique to us? Because obviously there's many, like having a high quality product you know, is important and acting with integrity is important. But if we make quality and integrity our corporate values, then there's really nothing that it says about us as a, as a company. Um, so the result of that process was a set of six and they kind of come in pairs. And the first one is empathy. And so we often say empathy as expressed through courtesy, courtesy being the second one. And the reason that's important is, first of all, it's, uh, it's a valuable skill for being successful in the kind of business that we're in. So if, you're, if you have no empathy, it's very difficult to be able to design good software or, or understand what people need. Same thing is true inside the company. So a, a little digression from the values for a second. The mission is to make people's working lives simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. And um, a year after we came up with that, we realized, whoa, that actually applies just as well internally as it does externally. So if we were all making an effort to make people's or each other's working life simpler, more pleasant, more productive, that would make it a great place to work. And um, empathy certainly helps with that. And so the actual practice of it is often expressed in courtesy. Um, and you can have courtesy without being without having any empathy. Like psychopaths are pretty good um, at that. Um, it, the second set is craftsmanship tempered with playfulness, because we obviously want to do a very good job. And playfulness I mean, does show up in our brand and like, our Twitter feed and stuff like that as a little bit of silliness. Um, but it's not meant to be just slapstick or humorous. I think there's uh, anyone here has ever played a musical instrument with other people or played a team sport with other people. There's this sense of playfulness that's like you, you're doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing. You're playing the onbeat or the offbeat or you're, you're you know, you're the left wing or whatever, um, and you're simultaneously paying attention to what everyone else is doing and in real time responding to that in this improvisational way. So that's the sense of, of playfulness that we really appreciate. And also looking at things with a different perspective. There's that famous poster of Einstein sticking his tongue out, you know, when people actually put that up on their wall in college. Uh, 
at the Institute for Advanced Study at the same time as Einstein was the Austrian mathematician Karl Gödel, and uh, no one has the poster of Gödel on their wall because he's a paranoid asshole who just <laughs> thought that people were trying to poison him all the time. And that's just not at all playful. So people relate to playfulness, I think, in, a, in an important way. Um, and then the last two are, this was the tough word to come up with. So the idea came from um, Greek philosophy, the word eudaimonia, which is the, the kind of happiness one gets from fulfilling one's purpose irrespective of what one's purpose is. So the closest we could get to that was flourishing, but then people thought we meant like that gesture. Um, and so instead, we chose the word thriving. Um, and the import of that one is in the, in the same sense of please attach your own oxygen mask before assisting others, probably the best thing we can do for ourselves, for our coworkers, for our family, for our community, for our fellow church members, or however you want to put it, the people that you relate to, is to become the best version of yourself. Um, and so I think people have a responsibility to that, and that's something that we want to encourage. And then the last one is solidarity. So we say sometimes thriving both in ourselves and others. Because if that's the best thing that we can do as individuals, then supporting one another in doing that is the best thing we can do in in relation to one another. So there you go. Yeah. And what's the quick backstory of how you came up with those? Is that is that a group effort? Did you do it on Slack? Uh, no, this is, this is a good point. This is an in-person meeting um, over the course of a couple of days. And um, it was, you know, people called out candidates and there's brainstorming. We put them on the wall and we slept on it, came back, and we tried to find, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that didn't make the, the list to the end. For example, honesty was one of them. Fairness was another one. And we tried to find ways in which those could be you know, captured, or the intent of those could be captured by a, a smaller fundamental set. Um, and then we actually let it sit for six months or so to see how we really felt about it, and then and reopened that um, that document and, and said, okay, we still look good, so now it's official. And when you rolled it out, was the reaction good from people? Or? Yeah, I think, I mean, I mean, it's a pretty hard set of things to argue with. Like right. No one's going to be like, no, I'm anti-empathy. What about excellence? Know. Yeah, no, craftsmanship. <laughs> and, and so do you explicitly use those as a screen for hiring to make sure that the people have the qualities that you want the culture to have? Yeah, and I think we're also careful to people showing up for an interview or you know, to a certain extent showing up in the way that they might in their online dating profile or something like that. They're trying very carefully to present an aspect of themselves in, in a way that they think that is gonna demonstrate their ability to, to do the job or to be a good fit. Um, and we, I don't think we wanna demand a very narrowly prescribed set of personalities because we want to be able to have all kinds of people work there and we don't want to accidentally screen people out. So we did at one point in the hiring process literally have like on the scorecard that people fill out for the candidates, we had like rate them on a scale of one to 10 for courtesy and, on, and empathy and stuff like that. Um, and we realized that was just too on the nose. Like that wasn't, it's, first of all, it's very difficult to rate people after a 45 minute or one hour interaction with them. And second of all, it wasn't actually telling us um, something important. So I think the characteristics of the people, I mean, obviously we, we hope that they share those values, but I think it's something that people can very much buy into after they join the company. So Slack is growing quickly. Um, you're having to scale the company, but you yourself are having to scale as a CEO with that fast growth. So if you could share with the group some of the challenges that you're finding as, you know, it's got so much coming at you from so many different directions. What are the challenges? How are you dealing with them? So one of the big challenges for me personally, and this I think has to do with maybe more with my personality type and maybe there's some ha ha Canadian in it or something, but I really don't like disappointing people and the, the extent to which I have to disappoint people just increases every day. So like there is, I don't know how many LinkedIn requests and how many can you come and talk to my company or can I get 15 minutes of your time to tell you about my idea or um, you know, even people like old friends and um, you should check out this company they're looking to be acquired or I know this other person who wants to be hired. And there's just like, it would be impossible for me to even reply to all of them with, right. you, unless I just had an auto reply that said no or something like that. Um, and there's like this, like there's a, I don't know, an emotional, cost to that, like that is just drained out of me every day to, to have to um, disappoint people in that way. And there's also like, there, that manifests itself for anyone here who is a manager um, at any scale, 
you do the annual review process or you don't, you do whatever it is, and guess what? Everyone at the company wants, thinks that they should be promoted like every six months. Um, and not everyone is going to be the boss, and so um, that's not going to happen, and therefore you're like constantly disappointing people. I mean, I do, at the same time, we're happy. We have customers who love it, and, when, and the company is being very successful, and our investors are happy, and our employees will make money on their equity, all those kinds of things. So there's plenty of like good byproducts, but the, I don't remember what the question was now, but I think it was something <laughs> about uh, the challenges of scaling challenges yourself. Challenges of scaling. Uh, scaling yes. yourself. The other one is, is like trying to identify, so every once in a while I'm doing something, I'm like, wow, there's no way I can continue to do this and still do everything else I'm supposed to be doing. And that's usually a signal that it is time to make someone else responsible for whatever this thing is. And the, the there's this like kind of, I guess this is very typical for human beings because we do all kinds of stupid things that we know we shouldn't do. But the the pain that I anticipate of delegating this thing because it's so important to me and I think I'm so smart and I can do this really well and I already I used to do it all the time versus the pleasure that I experience when it is actually being taken care of by someone else and they're doing a good job uh, is, is, a, is a weird one. So I think that's a, a big challenge as well to identify those things um, and the, the correct priority in which to hand them off. So if you have a line of people outside your office coming in wanting promotions and all that, I mean, I'm just curious how you handle those. So if we were just role playing, I'm coming in your office, Stuart, I've been doing this job for six months. I am self-evidently awesome. Um, I am ready for a promotion, and what will it be? Um, how, what do you say? Go talk to whoever you're at. <laughs> <laughs> what if your direct report wants? Yeah, well, you know, the people that report to me typically have a, of a couple decades, of, or you know, at least a decade of experience, and have more maturity in the workplace than that. So I'm luckily shielded from some of that stuff. Um, sometimes I'll passive aggressively complain about the difference between millennials and my generation, and entitlement, or something like that. Um, but the, I know what the right answer is, like what I should actually be doing, which is to talk about you know, being more explicit about the ways in which um, they need to develop in order to to hit the next level, you know, and most of that is being willing to take responsibility. It doesn't matter what kind of position, um, I mean, sales versus engineering or you know, marketing versus finance, um, and and how to cultivate that. So, step back question on the valley. You've got your finger on the pulse of it. What's going on in terms of financial? I mean, fair amount of churn that we're reading about. Um, there's a perception, but you have a better sense of the realities. So what's happening? So uh, I am no better than anyone else in this respect. And yet it is also humorous for me to see the change in the narrative from people like who's, who six months ago would say one thing, and then there's a change in the performance of the public markets, and now their philosophy of how business should be done has changed as a result. Even though they've been around for 20 years and, you know, uh, over the course of our lifetime, and most people here are old enough to remember um, maybe not 1982 um, or 1987 or 1991, but certainly 2000 and 2008, and there's just a cycle. And this is like something that hasn't been controversial since 1820 or so. Um, and uh, there are dips and valleys, and, and I, the the performance of the public market is going to make a difference in the nature of the opportunities that are available to you. I mean, so I said this to one of your colleagues um, uh, last summer, that this is the best time to raise money since the time of the ancient Egyptians, and it was then, and it's not now. Um, and so we raised money at a, at a very high valuation. Um, but it, we, we didn't, as a result of that, think we should operate the business in a different way. I mean, we still have very specific targets for gross margins, and we still have a lot of discipline. And the fact that we have a lot of money in the bank is still, and we haven't spent it, is a hedge against a further deterioration in market conditions and you know, just being opportunistic about what we can expect. So um, that is not going to be true for everyone. Like, um, there are businesses that are predicated on the ability to scale very rapidly, and, and that ability is dependent on the, the availability of very cheap capital, and if cheap capital goes away, then you don't, who knows whether the business would have worked had you got to that scale, because you might not have the, the opportunity. Um, the, there's an interesting dynamic, though, I guess, I don't, this is maybe not universally interesting, so I'll leave it here. Um, the way venture capital works is people raise money from LPs, and it's a, usually a 10-year commitment. 
and uh, venture capitalists don't get their management fees if they don't invest that money. So when they raise very big funds, um, when the market is hot, so 2014, 2015, they have a huge amount of money, but they have the same number of partners and the dynamics of the business don't change. So they're gonna make the same number of investments every year. And if you have a larger fund but are making the same number of investments every year, then the amount that you're investing has to be larger, just, like, just simple arithmetic. Um, and that means that the valuations are going to stay high or you're gonna choose later and later stage deals because you can't invest a billion dollars, five million dollars at a time. So be a, like, it'll take a very long time for this to have an impact. I mean, we're, we're uh, th and this is, my father's a real estate developer, so this just seems totally crazy to me, but you know, we're, we're just signed an offer to lease for $67 a square foot. Um, and that's not gonna change next year or the year after. That'll, there'll be a, a slow movement and the salary pressure that we've been seeing build over the last couple of years may cool off, but it's not like you know, people who were getting offers from Facebook for a quarter of a million dollars base comp and $500,000 in RSUs every year are suddenly gonna go to $100,000. Know, maybe the rate of increase will, will diminish and it could even go down slightly, but it's not gonna be dramatic. 30 second question before we go to the audience. What's your advice for Yahoo? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, so I, I, you know, I honestly haven't been paying very much attention, but I think at this point, um, the sell the core business and become a holding company for their Alibaba shares seems like the best course of action. So good luck, Verizon. Audience questions, I'm sure there's a bunch. Right there. And again, if you could state your name and who you work for. I asked him about some startup founder, uh, also first engineer at Dropbox. So I've been watching your career for a while. I don't know how much people know, but obviously with both Flickr and Slack, you kind of started with companies that were not doing those things and turned into companies that were. I would love it if you would talk a little bit more about that process of one, having an organization that can come up with these new ideas that totally change what the company is, and two, how do you bring the whole organization with you? Yeah, okay, so sometimes I get asked the question, like what makes you tick, and it's just like, uh, a, an overpowering fear of failure. So um, the answer to this is going to be related in the sense that I get my inspiration from being absolutely desperate. So um, Reed and Joey, who were just on stage before, um, were actually angel investors in Flickr. But that was in 2004. Go a couple of years earlier, 2002, when we started the company that would eventually make Flickr. Um, this was after the dot-com crash. This was after WorldCom and Enron and all those accounting scandals. Um, it was after 9-11. So it was just like the, literally the lowest point in a long time. The net stack was off 80%. S&P 500 was down 65%. No one wanted to invest in internet things at all. And if they were going to invest in internet things, it was not going to be our stupid web-based massively multiplayer game. And just not being able to have money in order to pay people salaries was the motivation to find something else that we could do with the technology um, and, and actually get to market quicker so that we had a, a chance of actually building something. And so that's how Flickr came to be. Uh, Slack was actually pretty different because we started the company in 2009. It was myself and three other of the original Flickr team members. Um, and it was a different funding environment. We had a lot of credibility. We were able to raise money really easily. And we got to the point, and this is uh, the end of 2012, where we just realized that what we had built up to that point, 45 people, three and a half years in, um, was never going to be the kind of business that would justify the $17.5 million in venture capital investment that we'd taken on. So we're just never going to work in the way that this system was, this, this company was set up to, to work. Um, and so we had to shut it down. And we were in the very fortunate and happy position of having built a system for internal communication that we all agreed we would never work without again. And we looked around to see what else was out there. There wasn't anything like it, we thought. And so we said, this would be an interesting product and we should pursue it. So um, in both cases, the, like, it was not liking to fail, I guess, was the, was the motivation and, and how it came to be. That's great. We've got time for one more question. Sir. Uh, hi there, Bill Chandler. Until recently, I was Chief Communications Officer and Government Relations Leader at Gap Inc. Uh, we tested Slack about a year or so ago. Um, also, I want to dig a little deeper into empathy, and I appreciate how prominent it is for your company. I'm also helping the University of Southern California with a third space initiative that helps bring empathy and adaptability to life. But with the view of empathy, when you look at companies where Slack isn't successful for whatever reason, 
What are some of the cultural barriers to something that's so open and transparent as Slack? Well, so there's a couple, I mean, I don't know, I was gonna say there's a couple of reasons. There's, there's probably a very long list of, of reasons it can fail. So I th some of them are um, you know, entirely our fault in the sense that the product marketing isn't clear enough to give people an idea of what they're getting into or what they should expect or the, the new user experience isn't clear enough in, in how you're supposed to use the software. And as I said earlier, it doesn't matter how well we do that. If you just turn it on all at once for 5,000 people, it's just not going to work. Like, there has to be some system of how it is going to be used inside of that company um, in order for it to be successful. And then I, mean, I think there are some patterns of, uh, of operation, and specifically management, for which Slack is not well suited. And, and at the other end of the spectrum, or the, I think it's more the organization's fault that it doesn't work. And again, to be clear, I think it's usually going to be our fault that it doesn't work. But where it doesn't work because of the structure of the organization, it's typically because one of the patterns that some managers develop is the exercise of their power through the withholding of information. And if the one of the principal values of the tool is that it makes things much more transparent and people are able to see what their colleagues and other departments are working on and people are able to see what's going on in parts of the company to which they would never otherwise have visibility, that's very threatening, um, and it, you know, it makes people kind of jerk back the chain on, on what's going to be allowed, and that causes the whole thing to fail. So yeah, and then and in between that, there's going to be a whole continuum of, of other reasons. Great insights. Thank you so much, Stuart. No Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you.